Greetings to you and welcome to this session on the Gospel of Mark. I'm Pastor Timothy Musley, pastor here at St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Alliance, Ohio. It's a joy to be with you today. Thank you for your investment and your time and your willingness to be part of this ministry, to be part of this program. It's by your willingness to do this that I have the willingness and the desire and the drive to fulfill it. So thank you for being part of it. Thank you for all the work that you have put into it and following along. Thank you for all of the investment that you've made. I've said many times. Time is our greatest investment. And so if we are not, so what we put our time into is that which is most important to us. And if we're not paying attention, then, you know, we're just kind of like wasting our time. So thank you for your willingness to put your time into this. Thank you for your willingness to invest in it. I would certainly say that if you find it to be beneficial, please share it out there so that others may experience it. Uh, If you've connected to it through the Facebook page or through Instagram, please follow us. Uh, Go ahead and share it out there tag us in. I'd love to see, you know, where you're connecting to us at. Please get it out there through, uh, through those means. If you're connecting through, like through the website into my YouTube page, please subscribe to my YouTube page. That way then anytime that something pops up, anytime new information comes out, then you can go ahead and follow along. Uh, You can email this, direct message it, share it in any way, shape or form, any way that you can get this information out there. It's one of the joys of being a Christian. It's one of the calls of being a Christian is to share the message, is to take this beautiful and burdensome story that we have been given and share it out there with others. One of the beautiful things about where we are here in the 21st century, this part of the 21st century, is that we have this beautiful and this wonderful avenue of sharing this information out there uh, in ways that we don't even have to engage in anybody. We don't have to talk to anybody or be involved with anybody. We can just share it out there. We can just put it out there. We can share it. We can hit, uh, you know, we can like it. And then, and then all of a sudden, you know, all your friends out there see it. That's kind of the matrix. That's the that's the way that social media works. If you share it out there, then all your friends, all the ones on your list, get a chance to have an opportunity to see it. And if you make a comment about it or what have you, that just emboldens the 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 the, the matrix all the more. That emboldens the the way that the uh, the social media platforms work, so that other people get a chance to engage in it. If this is your first time joining us, well then welcome aboard. Thanks for being part of the program. It's great to have you as part of the work that we do. Uh, I would certainly encourage you to, to listen along. You don't have to turn back on it or or stop because you haven't caught up so far. Uh, you're going to get plenty out of it today, but I definitely would encourage you to go back and listen to the previous episodes. We started at the beginning. I gave a good who, what, where, when, and why of the Gospel of Mark, and then we move forward with the Gospel itself. So we've been walking through up to this point. So there's a lot of information back there. I definitely would encourage you to check it out. Go back and listen to it. And if you've been following along, certainly you know, you can go back and listen to those things as well. But welcome back. Thanks for being here. Uh, for those of you that don't know, there are a number of other Bible resources back there on my YouTube channel. I've done a piece on the book of Revelation, on the book of Romans, and on the Gospel of John, as well as some piece on the Nicene Creed and what it means to be Lutheran. So so there's some things back there in the archives that you can go looking for. I uh, would welcome you know anybody who would like to participate in any of that. That's a great gift and a great joy. So so I'd encourage you to do that. I'd encourage you to do that uh, at some point. I also encourage you to have a Bible open before you. doesn't matter what your translation is, uh, whether it's a digital copy or paper copy. That doesn't matter to me either. Just that you have the Bible open, that you have some reference to the word that you're reading open before you. Because this is important uh, from a... Um, from a gathering perspective, from a studying perspective, because we want to make sure that we are following along and getting the word. So have a Bible open before you. Now, if you're listening to this and you're driving or you're gardening or you're working out and you can't have a Bible open, I understand that. I get that. And that's all good. It's all fine. You don't need to stress about it. You don't even need to stop what you're doing. I'm just happy that you're listening. Uh, but if you can have a Bible open, it's always nice to be able to engage the Bible, read the Bible, and be in the Bible. We are Christians and we are uh, we are steeped in the scriptures. The scriptures are our story of what God is doing in the world. And as Lutherans, as coming from a Lutheran perspective, we are word and sacrament people. So the word is first and foremost, sola scriptura, as uh, as Luther would say, solely scripture. So we don't 
We don't immediately look to uh, tradition or experience or the writings of our church fathers and mothers. We go to scripture, scripture first, scripture first. So it's good to know your scripture. It's good to be able to engage your scripture, even if even if you don't memorize it. And I'm not a real big proponent of memorizing things, because when you memorize something, you you in, you get it into your short term memory, but it doesn't necessarily have any power or meaning in your life. It's just words that you remember and spit out. I want you to know the scriptures. I want you to be able to engage the scriptures. I want you to be able to understand the scriptures, but I don't want you to just be able to just like, you know, regurgitate scriptural words, Bible words. That's not what we're looking for. That's not what it means to walk the life of faith. And I don't want anybody to think that that's what it's supposed to mean to walk the life of faith, because that is not the case at all. That's why I'm not a proponent of, of, of memorizing the scriptures, but I am a proponent of knowing how to engage the scriptures and walk through them accordingly. That way, when you need the scriptures, that way, when you need to engage the word, you can do it in a manner that is faithful and and not frustrating. You know, the the Bible is huge. There's so much going on in the Bible, and there's so many different avenues and options and capabilities. There's pieces of wisdom and literature and history, and there's the works of Jesus and Paul. And if you know where those are, if you know how to engage them, well, then you're far more uh, advanced than most people are. And and look, let's be honest. I mean, most people are going to have access to a Bible. You know, the way that our world is today with, with digital digital media and digital access. You almost always have a Bible. If you've got a phone in your pocket, you got a Bible in your pocket. It's not that hard to do. So being able to engage it, being able to engage the Bible, it's far more important and far more powerful than just um, than, than just listening to the word. So that's why I want you to have a Bible open. That's why I want you to be able to engage the word and engage the scriptures accordingly. And, I, and it's also a great practice because then you can invite others in. You can invite others into the scriptures uh, and you can invite others into the story and, and how they engage it. You can show them by knowing you. So so the Bible is open. The, the Bible's uh, divided into two sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament is the story of God from creation all the way up to to the birth of Jesus. And then the New Testament is the birth of Jesus uh, through his crucifixion and resurrection, then the birth of the early church, and then from the early church all the way through to the apocalypse and the recreation of the world. Uh, so that's that's how the Bible is laid out, Old Testament, Old Covenant, up to Jesus, New Covenant, Jesus moving forward. Each book of the Bible is divided into chapter and verse. Now, one of the things that you need to know And sometimes we see this really, really fully as we're studying the Bible. Sometimes we see this really, really obviously as we're looking at the text is that sometimes these 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 chapters and verses they were added later so the text was written just as a narrative as a you know and then these chapters were later or added later to kind of divide up thought processes and then um, verses were added on top of that really more for for um, study purposes and engagement purposes so chapter and verse that's what's added to um, the Bible. Uh, so we're going to see that sometimes these these chapters, they're added or these verses are added re- really kind of haphazardly. They're in the middle of thought processes or in the, li- in the middle of moments. Uh, so we can see that they're later additions. So when we refer to chapter and verse, they were not written with chapter and verse in mind. They were actually written without chapter and verse and chapter and verse were added later to uh, make it easier to engage in the Bible itself. So we are in chapter four of the gospel of Mark. Now, Mark is the second book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So Mark is the second book of the New Testament. And so um, it is the second of the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Um, And Mark is the shortest and Mark is the oldest. And historically speaking, we understand that Mark is the oldest book of the New Testament, um, of the gospels, I should say. Uh, The letters of Paul were written before Mark, but of the gospels. Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark is the oldest. But when the canon fathers, uh, canon meaning plumb line or ruler, um, when the canon fathers put the scriptures together, they believed that Mark was the oldest book written, was the first gospel written. So that's why it shows up first in the Bible, even though it is not as old as Mark. We've learned that Mark derives from the Q document and the Q document, which is like a sayings of Jesus. Um, so the Q document 
the Q document and Mark are really the foundation, and then Matthew and Luke draw from the Q document and then add to it on top of that. So, so that's why we have what we have. And then the John, um, you know, John's gospel is really a different gospel. He, he's John's writing to a specific community about a hundred years after, um, about seven between eighty and hundred years after the crucifixion and resurrection. Mark, Mark is is purported to be written about sixty between sixty and seventy A.D., uh, which would be about thirty years thirty five years after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. So that's just to kind of give you some context. All right, so we're in chapter four, and we're at a point now where Jesus' revelation, Jesus is revealing himself as the Messiah, as the Son of God. Jesus is showing off. He's earning his street cred. He's doing miracles. He is teaching. He is healing. This all has to happen. Jesus has to separate himself from all of the other messiahs. And yes, there would have been a great many other messiahs that would have come along. You know, keep in mind, Jesus, the, 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 the Israelites have been looking for a Messiah for a thousand years. And so Jesus would have just been another, you know, proclaimer, you know, I'm the Messiah, just like all these other messianic figures. However, so Jesus needs to do things. That's where the miracles, that's where the signs come in that separate him from the other messiahs. I mean, people can claim to be the Messiah and they can have a few magic tricks up their sleeve that may, you know, do some illusionary stuff. But Jesus isn't doing magic. This isn't magic. This is control. This is godlike stuff. And we're going to see more of that today as we wrap up chapter four. Okay. So chapter th- chapter four, verse 35 and following. On that day, when evening had come, Jesus said to them, let us go across to the other side and leave the crowd behind. They took him with them in a boat, just as he was. Other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose and the waves beat into the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. But he was in the stern asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. Then the wind ceased, and there was a dead calm. He said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great awe and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Okay, so we have Jesus here in the boat. He spent a great deal of time teaching by the sea. Great clouds came along. You know, he gave the the parable of the sower. He taught the other disciples uh, and then taught them other parables, uh, taught them the way that they are lived. So he spent all day teaching. He spent all day giving. Now, one of the things that we need to understand and make sure that we're really, really clear about when we look at Jesus is he is, in fact, a human being. He is not some kind of robot. He is not He is not meant to be seen as some kind of demigod, if you will, or something greater, something that has some kind of godlike ability to overcome human need. He needs to be seen fully human. So you think about the full humanity. You spend all day teaching. You spend all day showing and telling and sharing. You're going to be exhausted. You're going to be exhausted by the time the day is done. And unlike, you know, you get to go home from work at the end of the day and, and kind of, you know, shut your phone off and, and just chill, Jesus is going to continue to be followed because he's doing some incredible things. He's doing some amazing things for the kingdom and people are taking notice. So, so he really can't get away. So really the only way that he's going to be able to get away is to get into a boat and go to the other side of the sea. The only way that he's going to be able to get away is get into the boat, get into into whatever boat and go out into the water because then there then the only way that people can follow is in, is if they're in other boats and and then they have to tie everything together and it, it's all kinds of different stuff okay so so that's not what's going to happen that's not what's going to happen so Jesus gets in the boat with the disciples and they set out for the other side of the sea couple of things here to realize. Again, we've talked before about this Jesus being a God on the move. He is one who is always on the move. He is one who is always looking to change or grow or advance. He's one that's always on the move. Uh, so, so he's not going to stay in one place and let the people come to him. He's going to go to the people because that's what he does. He goes to the people. 
So he spent a significant amount of time with the people on this side of the sea. So he's going to the other side of the sea. He's going to the other, another group of people. He is not staying in one place. So he gets in a boat and he leaves the crowd behind. And they took him with them in the boat just as he was, just, to, just where he was at. They didn't prep him, make him big. They took him just as he was. He, and, and he was probably wiped out from spending all day teaching and healing and helping people to grow because he's Jesus. He's human. So as much as we'd like to say that he's like superhuman, like he never gets tired uh, or he never falters. No, that's not fair because then that would take away his humanness. And if it takes away his humanness, well, then we really don't have an incarnation. We have a demigod. We have somebody who's better than us, bigger than us, stronger than us. And, and we can't have that. That doesn't work work when it comes to uh, that doesn't work when it comes to our understanding of our relationship with Jesus. So they get in the boat and they go to the other side. Other boats were with him. Okay. So, so I mean, if we think about it, you know, the disciples have all been called now, all 12 are together. So they're probably not all going to fit in one boat. They're probably going to need multiple boats and there's going to be others that are going to follow. There's going to be other fisher people. There's going to be other boats. So they're still going to want to have access to Jesus. You know, having access to Jesus is important. They're going to want access to him. They're going to want to talk to him and learn from him and hear his word and receive his healing. So, so we can't, we can't just think that Jesus is going to get away scot-free. There's going to be others that follow. And, and maybe this is God's way. Maybe this is God's way of, of doing a couple things here. You know, so as they're out on the sea, a great windstorm arose. Now, let's think about a couple of things here. Do the, you know, we, we understand that nature has what nature has, and nature does what nature does. Storms happen because storms happen, of course. Uh, but is it not possible? And, and I, I tend to think more and more about this. If Jesus is looking to have uh, some peace and quiet, then this great windstorm could very well be a hand of God moving along to deal with the other boats to deal with the ones that may be following along that want to continue to press on Jesus. They want to continue to draw from Jesus. Uh, there's also the opportunity here for Jesus to give a little bit of proof texting to his uh, disciples about who's in charge of who and who's in charge of what. So this great windstorm arises. It, it, it comes up and it's battering the boat. The waves are up. I don't know if anybody has ever, any of you have ever been, you know, out on the sea when it's windy or out on a lake when it's windy and see the waves rise up. And these boats weren't very big. Okay. These were fisher boats. They were, uh, you know, they were, they, they weren't very big. Uh, so they weren't meant to be very big. These were poor people who didn't have a whole lot. And these are boats that aren't very big to begin with. You know, since we really are culture of visual learners, it's it's a really kind of hard to grasp exactly what this looks like. But but to be clear, this would have been a very tumultuous place. The boat would have been battered all over the place. Um, and Jesus, for his part, is asleep in the stern on a cushion. He's asleep. This is one indicative of how tired he is, how exhausted he would have been from doing this work physically. As a human being, he would have been exhausted from doing this work. Again, that points to his humanity. That points to his humanness, which is really, really important for us, again, to continue to grasp. Jesus isn't superhuman. He's, not, he's never meant to be superhuman. We don't want him to be superhuman. So he's tired. He's exhausted. He's, and he's asleep on the cushion. Now, two things about this. First thing is, is kind of environmental. The boats that they were on, the front of the boat would have had a covering. Okay, so, so there would have been a platform on the deck. Uh, so, so, and then there would have been like a little cubby underneath. So as fishermen, as they're out there fishing, you want to be able to stand up right at the rail. So there would have been like a little deck up front. And it would have been waterproof so that they could store stuff underneath to keep it dry and so that they could stand up at the rail when they're pulling their um, pulling their nets in. So Jesus was asleep. He, that's where he was. He was in the in that little covering. OK, he was in the covering uh, and the covering would have been either in the front or the back, depending on uh, where, you know, depending on the style of the boat. And in the scriptures, it says he's in the stern. He's in the back, which that's that's the stern. The stern is the back. And, and he would have been undercover 
I mean, if you're if you're in a you know if you if you're in a storm, uh, and and some of the other scriptures talk about it being a storm. You know, this this is a a wave, uh, you know, wind storm and waves. But even then, the waves are going to be crashing over the bow. How is he not getting? How is he not being woken up for being wet? You know, so water would have been splashing on him. Uh, except that he's under this cover. He's under this uh, this this platform, this decking, if you will. And he's on a cushion and he's asleep. So he's he's asleep. He's exhausted. But the other thing is this. The other thing is this. You know, and I've said this before. You know, when a bird lands on a on a branch, it doesn't land on that branch because it trusts the branch. It lands on the branch because it trusts its wings. So if it lands on a branch and the branch breaks, it just flies away. So Jesus isn't trusting the boat to get him to the other side. He's trusting himself. He's trusting God to get him to the other side. So he's capable of sleeping in the stern because, well, I mean, he trusts God. He trusts that God's going to take care of this, that nothing is going to happen to him. All right. That nothing's going to happen to any of them. This is the mission. This is God's work in the world is right here. So nothing's going to happen to any of them. So so he's asleep. He can trust this. He can trust his capabilities. He can trust that if the boat overturns, he can handle this. And if he can handle it, he's not going to be worried about it. Well, the disciples, on the other hand, they're quite worried. Uh, they're quite worried about what's happening to the point where they're being a little over dramatic. Uh, and I think, again, I think that we as believers, we can be a little over dramatic when it comes to our interaction with God. We can think that, and, and not to say that we don't face challenges, and challenges are difficult, but we can often think that our challenges are life-ending or, or universe-ending when they're really not. And, and look at what, uh, you know, look, look at what the disciples do. So, um, you know, the, uh, the boat's already being swamped, which means that there's water coming in, uh, but, but they're far from, you know, they're, they're far from lost. But what do they say? So they wake him and say, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Do you not care that we are perishing? So for one thing, there's a little bit of emotional manipulation there that the disciples are trying to enact and employ. Do you not care that we are perishing? But the other aspect is, you know, they're, they're, they're not, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're coming at Jesus um, in this state of catastrophe when it's really not a catastrophe yet. And it's far from a catastrophe. Ah, uh, yes, it's windy and it's waves, and but they're a seasoned fisherman; they know how to deal with this. But all of a sudden, all of their ways of dealing with it are thrown out the window because they got Jesus sleeping in the stern. Which again is, I think, another fascinating spiritual thing. Uh, when when we come into the to the uh, to the work of Jesus, is that you know we've got Jesus in our lives, so all of our experience and our knowledge and our our training, we just throw it out the window. Well, we let Jesus do it. These guys are fishermen. They know what to do on the sea. They know what to do when a when a storm crops up. And here they are. You know, are you not? Do you not care that we're perishing? Well, of course he cares. Um, and and they're trying to they're and they're trying to emotionalize it. They're trying to, you know, polarize Jesus. Do you not care? Are you so, you know, here we are. We've given everything for you, Jesus, and we're going to die. Do you not care? You know, a, a little little drama llama going on there. I mean, look at how much we, you know, we're going to die here. Don't you care about us? Uh, you know, and, and, and they see that because Jesus is asleep. He's not holding on to the gunnels terrified, white knuckled, hoping to get through the storm. He is sleeping away. He's doing what he needs to do. And that is rest. So he woke up, he woke up. So he's like, all right, he gets out of, uh, up from the cushion and he rebukes the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. So notice he doesn't say to the disciples, of course I care. How dare you? No. Or does he say, first he doesn't say, you know, calm down. Everything's going to be fine. He makes everything fine. He comes in and does this extraordinary thing for the sake of the disciples and for the sake of the story. He silences the wind. He calms the sea. He speaks to the sea and the, he speaks to the storm and the storm listens to him. So first we see that Jesus has the power to speak into this great storm and the storm listens. 
okay? And the storm listens. And I, and I love this, you know, I love this imagery. You know, when we're walking with Christ and we're walking through our life, we have this Savior who speaks into our storms. And yes, of course, we certainly have so many storms in our lives. We have things that crop up and storm all over us. But we have this Savior who speaks into our storm, who speaks into our reality and has the power to speak to our storms and has the power to speak to what's going on inside of us. And notice that Jesus is not in any way, shape, or form frightened by the storm. And nor does he even indicate that the storm is going to be catastrophic for the disciples. He just speaks to it. He says, peace, be still. Rebukes it. He sends it back. He sends it back and he silences it. He woke up and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, peace, be still. Then the wind ceased and there was a dead calm. So creation responds to Jesus. Storms respond to Jesus. Think about that vision, that that power, that imagery for just a minute as we dwell in our own lives and the idea of how God, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, has the capability of speaking into our storms and allowing, and, and then our storms listen to that. And it's so powerful to know that our Lord and Savior can speak to our storms. Now, one of the things that, you know, you might be thinking, well, God doesn't necessarily speak to my storms. Well, ask yourself something. How vocal are you at asking God to speak to the storm? I mean, look at what the disciples did. The disciples, though, they probably didn't necessarily pull a a, a really faithful tact, and Jesus is going to rebuke them for that too. But they called Jesus into the storm. Jesus, don't you care that we're perishing? Jesus, where are you in the midst of this? You know, and, and that's a very guttural response. That's a very guttural statement. I, I fear oftentimes that there's there's a lack of communication between us and God, not because we don't want to talk to God, but we're afraid, we're afraid that we can't talk to God in a manner that is faithful or acceptable. You know, we hear the great prayers. And and I'm you know and, and I certainly I certainly stand in line as one of those and I wouldn't say great as in look how wonderful I pray but but eloquent because I do this all the time I mean I pray I speak all the time and that's great and I'm glad to be able to do it but sometimes I I fear that what happens is then then there's this vision that prayer has to be this eloquent, huge, great, big, wonderful statement. When, I mean, look at the prayer that that Peter has. Lord, do you not care that we're perishing? Are you not paying attention? Hey, help us. Help us, God. Help us in the midst of this. That's the prayer that, 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 um, that the disciples are saying. It's very guttural. It's very, it's very close in. It's, it's, there's no eloquence to it whatsoever. It really is like kind of calling Jesus out. Hey, where are you in this? Maybe even more importantly, are you in this? Are you paying attention? Do you even see this? Do you see where I'm at, God? Do you see what's going on here, God? That, that is a very powerful statement, but a very important one because when we make that statement, when we express that statement, then we have the capability of, you know, of, of, of opening ourselves to what God is asking. We have the capability of opening ourselves to what God is calling for us and what God is seeking from us and how we can invite God into our storm. You know, when we're surrounded by the storm, and, and I, don't, I don't want to make light of it because uh, that's not the point, but when we're surrounded by a storm, when life is really crushing a storm inside of us, we're going to be like, you know, Heavenly Father, please, in the midst of your great and powerful mercy, please, please, you know, fill me with all, with all desire. No, we're, we're crying out, God, where are you in this? And that's where the disciples are now. I mean, it it certainly shows somewhat a lack of trust and Jesus is going to call us out and call them out for that. But first and foremost, Jesus speaks into the storm. He wakes up and, you know, teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He woke up and rebuked the wind and he said to the sea, peace, be still. Now, one of the other visions, one of the other things that we need to make sure that we keep in mind is that in the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, you know, we have this idea of, um, we have this idea of, of water as being chaos. 
You know, water is chaos. The sea is deep and unknown, and that's where the sea monsters live. That's where the great Leviathan plays in, as the as the Psalms would say. So there's this great unknown in the old, in, in the water. Again, and, and keep in mind, you know, we have so many things that help us to see down into the water. But if they couldn't, you know, they could they could only see as far as they could go. You know, when you you dive down maybe 10 feet or so and you open your eyes, you can't see anything. So there's very little clarity about what is in the water, about what the water contains or how the water contains. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, one of the things that I find fascinating and I've always found fascinating is the story of the Titanic. Uh, and so when they found the Titanic, uh, when they located it and they sent down cameras to finally get pictures of it after almost 100 years of being on the ocean floor, you know, I mean, it revealed so much that was unknown because that's just really the beginning of going that deep into the ocean floor. So, so you know, we're relatively new at being look, being able to look into the water uh, to that depth. So, for the Old Testament and for the New Testament, the 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 early church time, you know, water was a sign of chaos. Water was chaos, and walking on the water and being able to control the water was being able to control chaos. And this really, again, continued to increase Jesus' credibility. Uh, and and how it works. So, uh, you know, if if Jesus has the capability of controlling water, well, then Jesus has the capability of being, you know, of of being who he is and and being God. So so that that's that, that's a lot of what we're seeing here. This isn't just Jesus taking care of a boat. This is Jesus showing his mastery over creation. This is Jesus showing his mastery over the storm. This is Jesus showing his mastery over chaos. This is Jesus showing his mastery as the son of God. And he's really doing this to for the disciples. For the disciples. He's doing this for the disciples. He's proving this to the disciples. You know, as this great windstorm would have come up and the waves would have battered the boats, the other boats probably took off. And they don't certainly know what's going on in the boat of Jesus. So so this is very much a display of power and authority for the disciples. It's also a way to call the disciples into a greater level of faith. And that's what Jesus is trying to do is increase the faith of the disciples so that they know far more about what's going on and how to respond to this guy, Jesus. So after he proves his credibility, speaks to the chaos, calms the storm, he turns to the disciples, to this display. Now, part of it was, uh, you know, part of it was, you know, just a natural occurrence. Part of it was this display of power and authority. So he turns to the disciples and the next thing he says is, why are you afraid? What are you afraid of? Have you not figured out yet? And and so and and really is where does this fear come from? Where does fear come from? Fear comes from the basis for our fear of suffering. We're afraid because we don't want to suffer. Um, let's be honest. I've I've you know I, I do a lot of coaching and and my podcast is all about bettering life. Many of you have maybe listened to it or heard it. Why is it that we know what to do but we don't do it? Well, because we're afraid. And what is it that we're afraid of? We're afraid to suffer. We are afraid that we're going to experience suffering, that we're going to hurt, that we're going to not have fun. You know, we live in such a fun culture. We live in such a a comfort reality, Uh, even back in the disciples. Like, why are you afraid? What are you afraid of? You have the one who you clearly know has the power to deal with this. Why are you afraid? What are you afraid of? You know, what, why are you afraid? What are you afraid of? What is going to happen that is causing you such great fear? Why is it that you put less trust in me and more trust in your pain and your loss? And, and really, quite frankly, I mean, I, I, I look at the journey of individuals and faith communities across the board, and I ask the same question. You know, we have a God who moves mountains. We have a God who raised from the dead. We have a God who feeds 5,000. Why are we so afraid as people to share the gospel that maybe someone might not like us? Or why are we so afraid as a community to reach out to the hungry or the homeless or the poor or feed, uh, have food ministries or clothes ministries or reach out to people of different denominations or, or different colors or different genders or different um, faith backgrounds? Because we're afraid that in doing that, we're going to suffer suffer something. I don't know what we're going to suffer, uh, but we're going to suffer. Fear is what underlies so much. And Jesus says, why are you afraid? 
have you still no faith? Have you not seen what is going on here? Have you still not grasped who I am and what I'm doing in the world? Have you still no faith? So, so Jesus is, is doing this incredible thing here and, and he's showing this incredible power. And, and, but, but the disciples, again, the disciples are like a bird that won't land on the, on the branch because they don't trust the branch. Jesus is like, look, don't trust the branch. Who cares about the branch? Trust me. Who cares about the water? Who cares about the waves? Who cares about the boat? All of these things that you think you've wrapped yourself in in order to protect yourself. Don't trust them. Trust me. And that's, again, you know, if we look at the boat of our own lives, if we look at the journey of our own lives, I think a lot of people have built these boats with these things in it that they're trusting is going to bring them happiness or joy or peace or future. And Jesus is like, why are you doing that? Why do you trust all these things? And when they shake, you become afraid. Trust in the one thing that won't shake. And that's, oh, me. Don't be afraid. Why are you still not having faith? Why are you still not believing that I'm in control of the storm and I'm in control of life and I'm in control of all these things? That is the power of Christianity. That is the power of grasping the Messiah is that the Messiah is in charge of all of it. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? You know, he lays out for the disciples their response. And their response is to, to you know, I mean, and, and really kind of go after Jesus. Almost in, an, almost in a way that says, do you not care? We're going to die here, buddy. You along with it. Do you not care that we're going to die? Of all of this, do you not care that this is how it ends? Not like this. It doesn't end like this. For crying out loud. And they were filled with awe. So Jesus has, has stood up, he's calmed the sea, he's brought everything back into balance, and then he turns to the disciples, not in some, whoo, that was close, wasn't it? Wow, we just dodged a big bullet there, guys. Guys, do you really think after all that we've done and all that you've seen that it's going to end like this? Do you think that it's going to end this way? Come on. You need to have some faith here in the fact that the one you're following has the capability of doing a little bit more than this. The story isn't over yet. And this is a pretty pathetic Messiah story if I drown in the middle of the lake. Come on, have some faith. There's a TV show that came out a few years ago, and it parodies a movie that came out about 40 years ago. Um, and it's a really popular movie, and it's kind of resurged, and you know, and it's got a guy in a black mask with funny breathing and all that kind of stuff. Well, in the parody, there in one of the chapters, the main characters are all—they're all in this spaceship, and and one of them's like, "Oh, look! I mean, they're—you know—we don't stand a chance." And the main character's like, "Look, everybody." The story's not done yet, and all of the key players are in the ship. Do you think they're going to blow it up now? Well, that's kind of what Jesus does. He's like, look, the story's not done yet. I haven't fulfilled what I'm supposed to be fulfilling here. If I'm the Messiah, do you really think God's going to let me drown out here? And if I'm not the Messiah, well, hey, guess what? You guys are all stupid for following me because we're all going to die. So, so, you know, the, the disciples reveal that they allow fear to overwhelm their faith. And I think for a lot of us, you know, that's something that we continue to have to fight is that fear overwhelming our faith. Our faith is strong when things are easy, but our faith can really begin to falter when things get difficult. And we want to make sure that that's not the case. That's not how we live a life of faith. So they're in awe. So they see this happen. They're filled with great awe. And they said to one one another, who then is this that even the wind and the seas obey him? So finally, the disciples are starting to ask the bigger question. So he's not just a teacher. He's not just a feeder. He's not just a healer, but he's something bigger. He's something far more that even the wind and the seas obey him, that even the storms listen to him. So this is really where the, 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 the disciples will begin to carry forward the messianic mission. So why after the crucifixion and resurrection should the disciples come back to this? Because even the wind and the seas obey him. Even creation obeys him. And we all know that we may, we may understand creation fully. We can't stop it. I mean, as I'm recording right now, there's a bunch of snow that's fallen outside. And and it would be great if I'd be like, you know what? I'm in charge of creation. I'm going to stop the snow. I can't do that. 
I don't have that kind of power. That's not the power that I possess. And no matter how much I understand how creation works, creation still does what creation does, and I don't have the power to stop that. So, so, but Jesus does, Jesus has the power to affect creation. And for that, the disciples are in awe. They are just, they're taken aback by it. And that's what's so incredible and so powerful. Okay. So we're going to stop here uh, for now. Uh, I don't want to jump into the next section because uh, you know, there's a, there's a big, there's a big piece, um, something else that comes out here in the early part that I want to make sure we give proper credit to. But once again, thank you for being part of this. Uh, if you found this to be valuable, please share it out there. Please get it out there on your Facebook, your Instagram account, uh, or Twitter. Uh, if you find it on Twitter, if you're on, if you're on YouTube, then subscribe to my channel, uh, so that you get all the updates and all the information. You can share it out that way. You can email it, direct message it. If you have any questions for me or comments for me, you can reach out to me directly. Uh, you can do so. The, my contact information will come up at the end of the session. Please feel free to do that. I'd love to to hear from you if you have any suggestions or questions or what have you if i can answer them i will uh, in the next session if not i'll reach out to you directly be well god bless you thank you for being part of this section and we will see you next week